All right, so this is James for Beginners, uh, subtitled Practical Christianity. This is lesson number one, and the title of this lesson is Christianity More Than Ceremony. And we're just going to cover James chapter one, verse one. I'm going to do some background information tonight. If you were to ask people to define or to explain the word religion, just randomly, you know, you're doing on the street interviews and you would ask people to define or explain the word religion, they would probably describe the organizations and the ceremonies carried out by various church groups. This would uh, probably, uh, this is rather probably why younger people say that they are spiritual but they're not religious. They don't relate as easily to organized religion, if you wish, as our generation or you know, the people who were born uh, 50, 60 uh, years ago. And the reason for this is that they no longer relate to the various rituals and observances practiced by the large denominations in this country. So when you mention religious, religion to a younger person, they think this here, they, they, they think this big building, big organization. By spiritual institution, they have guessed that Christianity is more than just candles or processions or rituals and complex church hierarchies that dominate the Christian religion of our day. I mean, have you ever watched the news and they have a story about religion? What is the story? Well, it's about the Pope or it's about the Archbishop of this or they show the big long procession during Easter or at Christmas, the crowds, the ceremonies, the candles, that's what they show. And younger people are saying, yeah, I believe in God and I think I'm a spiritual person, but I don't relate to that stuff. I, I'm not interested in that, in that stuff. Unfortunately, most people do not realize that biblical Christianity really has only two observances that involve some type of ceremony or ritual. The first, of course, is you know, baptism, where a repentant believer in Jesus Christ is immersed in water and at that moment, by faith, receives forgiveness of sin, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and is added by God to the church. And we know about that. I don't have to go into a lot of detail, not with this class, but you can read about that in Acts 36 to 42 or Romans 6, 3. If someone at home is watching, somebody watching this video a little bit later on, if you want to see and read about that, there, there are some scriptures there that you can look at. The second ceremony is communion, where the church comes together on the Lord's day to share the bread and the fruit of the vine in order to commemorate the death of Jesus and to witness their faith and their hope in His resurrection and in His return. And you can read about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 26. And that's it. That's it, nothing else. These are the only two ceremonies given by God in the Bible for Christians to perform, and both of them have to do with personal salvation. In baptism, we experience salvation. In communion, we remember salvation. That's it. All the rest of it, all the parades, and all the smoke, and all the candles, and all the images, and all the stuff, that's all been invented by human beings. Those are all add-ons that don't have any real authority in the scriptures. Both of these ceremonies that I've just mentioned are intertwined since only baptized believers can take communion. Uh, we read in Acts 2, Luke writes, now when they heard this, they heard you know, Peter's preaching about the gospel, about Jesus' death and resurrection. It says, when the crowd heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off as many 
as the Lord our God will call to Himself. And with many other words, He solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received His word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, there's the communion, and to prayer. So all other ceremonies and traditions have been added by men and without any authorization, if you wish, from God. Now, the problem with these man-made ceremonies and traditions is when they become compulsory. I mean, is it okay if somebody uh, you know, celebrates Christmas or if somebody has a, a Tuesday thing, you know, like they fast on Tuesdays. You know, Tuesday is the day I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray and fast every Tuesday. Is there anything wrong? Well, no. No, the problem is when we make that compulsory for everybody else. We set that up as a religious law and everybody else has got to do it. So the result of all of this man-made activity is that Christianity has become for many people a series of festivals. You know, Easter, Christmas, you know, I mean, it's just they follow the calendar. Christianity for many has become simply a series of personalities. The Pope, cardinals, TV evangelists, and other individuals who have some sort of quote high position in some church organization, their comment, their shenanigans, whatever. And also a series of denominations, in other words, groups who have their own distinctive ceremonies and language, in other words, religious branding, religious branding. So certain churches have certain conversation, they put up the same sign in front of their buildings, uh, in order to identify themselves and separate themselves from other groups. Now you're wondering, what does this have to do with James? Well, what it has to do with James is this. Christianity is more than just ceremonies. It's more than just a religious leader who has some sort of you know, great following. It's more than just a building. It's a way of life. That's my point. That's going to be James's point. Christianity is a way of life. For example, every farmer, regardless of the country or time, has a similar lifestyle. It doesn't matter if you're farming in Bulgaria, or you're farming in Texas, or you're farming in Russia, you get up early in the morning, right? Farmers don't sleep in, no matter who or where they are. They work outside, not inside. They deal with the weather. Their complaint is always the same. Prices are up when they don't have a lot of <laughs> harvest and prices go down when they have a bumper crop. It doesn't matter where you farm, that's always the problem. They all have a similar lifestyle. Well, in the same way, Christianity is a certain lifestyle, irregardless of the time or place. And my personal beef is that Christianity has, has been made to be buildings and people and branding and this type of thing. And, 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 and the general public has lost the idea that Christianity is a lifestyle. So it's a way of life defined by what the Bible teaches, especially in the New Testament. It's a way of life that is very different from others who are not Christians. In other words, you know, why, why do we have a Bible study on Wednesday night? What, what is the, you know, what's the long game? What's the purpose of this? Is it just to inconvenience ourselves? Because there's other things we could be doing in the middle of the week that needs getting done, right? Why are we here? 
to have a class to say, well, I took in a class. Well, the class needs to be leading us to understand what is the lifestyle all about and how can I live it more effectively and how can I get more out of it and so on. And that should be the, you know, that should be the end game. So this, therefore, is going to be the purpose of our study, to learn about the Christian way of life as James explains it in his book and how to adapt to it. It's interesting to note that the book of James does not contain the gospel message. I mean, if all you had was the book of James, you couldn't, you couldn't save anybody's soul. You, know, you couldn't preach them the gospel because it's, the, it's not in the book of James. There's nothing in the book of James about how to save your soul. Uh, it doesn't mention baptism. It doesn't mention communion. It does not declare or explain Jesus' divinity or His ministry or His crucifixion or His, you know, nothing. You'd think, well, man, a book you know, that doesn't have any of that information, you know, is it really useful? Oh yeah, it's, it's really useful. It is, however, an extremely practical guide to living the Christian life in a way that pleases God, in a way that maintains order and peace in the church and provides a clear Christian witness to those outside the church. So the goal of you know, James's book is not to preach the gospel or to prove Jesus is the Son of God. That's not his goal. He wants to teach people that he's writing to, how do you live this life? It's not the same life as you had before you became a Christian. So in this first lesson, I'm going to do what we do in a, in a, you know, a basic Bible study. We'll do a bit of a, what's called a critical introduction. Who wrote it, why, when, we'll do that. And then we'll jump into some of the other stuff as we go on. So let's take a look at the author. First of all, James chapter 1, verse 1 is pretty easy. He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. So in that era, people signed letters at the beginning and then they put their greetings at the end. So when studying this epistle, you know, there's always the question of authorship, which James wrote this letter because there are four James mentioned in the New Testament. The first James, the brother of John, in Matthew 4.21 it says, uh, going on from there he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John his brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called to them, and he called to them, and he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. That was Herod that did that. Two references. So uh, the person who wrote James is not this James. He's not the brother of John because he died too soon. Okay? He died before this letter uh, was written. We, we uh, believe this letter was written somewhere between 40 and 60 AD and James, the brother of John, was put to death much earlier than that. So that kind of rules him out. Another James. James, the son of Alphaeus, the apostle. Uh, Matthew 10.3, it says, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Um, this James was referred to as James the Less. Probably uh, he was Jesus' cousin since his father was married to Mary. So this James right here, his father was married to a woman named Mary who happened to be the sister of Mary, the mother of God, because there were two sisters in that household that had the same name. And we've talked about that in other classes. It could be that she was you know, uh, 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 from another marriage, let's put it that way. Uh, or it could be that they used uh, the, uh, the form of the name, uh, a different form of the, name, of the same name for both of these, uh, for both of these uh, woman, women. Uh, 
this James here, there's no other mention of him in historical records. And so that kind of rules him out as well because the author of James was well known in the early church. And this here, uh, we have nothing, we, we don't know anything about this particular James, so that rules him out as well. James, number three, James the father of Judas, he's also an individual who is mentioned here, but he's not mentioned anywhere else other uh, than in one passage in the New Testament. So that kind of rules this out. Th there's three of the four James that have been uh, mentioned. The fourth James, James, the earthly brother of Jesus, Matthew 13, 55, says, is not this the carpenter's son? You know, people were questioning Jesus. It says, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, Jesus' brothers. So this James, this James here, who was the brother of Jesus, by giving only his name, he assumes that everyone knows who he is. You know, he, opens his, uh, he opens his letter and says, James, that's it. He doesn't say, James, this guy from that town, and you remember me, I was, a, you know, I was in Jerusalem. He just says, James. So he assumes anybody in the church who reads this letter will know who he is. Well, what, you know, what James had that kind of reputation in the first century? Well, the brother of the Lord. The brother of the Lord had that kind of reputation in the first century. He was not one of the apostles and he doesn't claim this in his epistle. You know, whoever's an apostle who writes uh, an epistle always you know, gives their name, like Paul you know, in Galatians 1 and uh, 1 and 1, Philippians 1. You know, Paul said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus. You know, James doesn't claim that he's an apostle of uh, Jesus. Um, we know from other passages that uh, the Lord's brother became a leader of the church in Jerusalem and thus had the authority to write such a letter. In Acts 15, 12, it says, all the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. So they were reporting their mission trip to the church in Jerusalem. Then it says, after they had stopped speaking, James answered saying, brethren, listen to me. Well, you have to have some status in the church if your audience is Paul and Barnabas and the other apostles and the elders, and you stand up and you say, brethren, listen to me. And so this James right here had authority, he had position in the church in Jerusalem, and um, he uh, helps craft a letter. The other interesting thing too is we know that you know, this James here, he's the one that crafted the, you know, the letter to the church about eating uh, meat and blood and so on and so forth. You know, there was a, a kind of uh, uh, some division in the church uh, at Antioch and he crafts a letter to them. And when you read his letter, the letter sent by him and the others to the church and you read the book of James, there are a lot of similarities in style, short, to the point, no wasted, no wasted uh, words. So uh, we believe, we meaning uh, most people who study these uh, things, uh, you know, textual criticism, so on and so forth, uh, believe that James, the earthly brother of the Lord, one of the early leaders in the church at Jerusalem, he was the one that wrote the epistle of James. All right. A little bit about his life. The Lord's brother who didn't believe in him before his death and resurrection, right? In John 7, it says, therefore his brother said to him, leave here and go into Judea so that your disciples also may see your works which you are doing. For no one does anything in secret when he himself seeks to be known publicly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not even his brothers were believing in him. So these words, who do you think spoke those words? Yeah, James and the others. They're saying to him, hey, if you're so good, you know, get out there. Don't, don't, don't stay here in Galilee, middle of nowhere. Get down there to Jerusalem, show yourself. 
you can almost read the, the mockery you know, in, between the, in between the lines. We know that this James was married, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Paul mentions that, you know, he says, don't I have a right? Don't we have a right to have a wife travel with us as do who? The apostles, James. So we know he was married. He and the rest of the family thought that Jesus was actually unbalanced and they tried to bring him home. In Mark chapter 3 verse 21 it says when his own people heard of this, you know, that, that there were so many crowds following him, some people were accusing him of being possessed by the devil. When they heard of this they went out to take custody. Notice the word, the word that they use custody of him. Not they went out to encourage him or they went out to, to greet him or they went out to try to encourage him to come home and rest. No, 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 no. They went out to take custody. Who takes custody of you usually? <laughs> the law, right? <laughs> usually has something to do with handcuffs. So they went out to take custody of him for they were saying he has lost his senses. Uh, that's so human, isn't it? I'm looking around here and everybody here you know, has children or you know, grown children, grandchildren, whatever. If your son was out there and they were accusing him of being out of his mind and he was causing riots and so on and so forth, wouldn't you be thinking maybe, maybe he needs to come home and rest a while? Take it easy? You know, stop stirring up all this trouble? We know that James was in the company of the apostles in the upper room after Jesus' appearance to him, Acts 1.14. Another writer, his name was uh, Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish uh, historian. He was not a Christian, but he lived at the time of Jesus and uh, as a historian recorded much of the history of that uh, era. So Josephus mentions James in one of his history books that James was killed in 62 AD by the Jews. They threw him off the wall down to you know, the Jerusalem, the wall around you. They threw him off the wall. He wasn't dead yet. So they went down to the rocks and they stoned him. He still wasn't dead. They clubbed him to death to just finish him off. So he had a pretty, a pretty difficult uh, death there. Um, so in his introductory verse, James refers to himself as a bond servant or a lowly slave of Jesus, thus demonstrating not only his love and his piety, but he also shows his humility. I mean, imagine he didn't believe in Jesus, he mocked him, you know, thought he was crazy, but then he became a believer. And I don't know about you, but I'd love to throw around the idea, yeah, yeah, he was my brother, hey, it's okay. You know, don't, don't want you people to get excited about it, but the Lord, you know, Jesus, he was my earthly brother. I knew him when, you know, none of this. Makes no mention of this. So let's look at the epistle itself. This epistle was written between 40 and 60 AD. It may even be earlier because there's no mention of the Gentile influx into the church after 45 AD. After 45 AD, the epistles written after that mentioned the trouble in the church because of the you know, Jewish Gentile friction. He mentions none of this, so probably a little earlier. Uh, it contains very little doctrine, no references to Jesus or the gospel, which I mentioned. It is extremely practical in its approach and one half, this is, I thought this stat was really amazing, one half of the verses are imperatives. You know what imperative is? You know, de a, a, a sentence which is the declaratory is what? It just says something, right? You know, I mean, the sky is blue. And then you have something that asks a question. What color is the sky? Right? But an imperative sentence is a sentence that, you know, stand up and pay attention. That's, a declare, uh, that's a, an imperative sentence. Gives a command. Half the verses Half the verses in his book are declaratives, uh, imperatives. Sentences written as orders or commands. Very short epistle, five chapters, but filled with practical teaching on how to successfully live the Christian life. 
All right, let's talk a bit about the purpose of the letter here. The letter is intended for Jewish Christians living away from Israel in various parts of the empire. During their history, the Jewish people were often conquered and subsequently they were dispersed to different countries. That's what uh, nations did in those days when they conquered another nation. You know, they burned everything down, they took the money, they took the, you know, the jewelry, whatever, and they spread the people to other nations to water down the bloodline. And that would you know, keep the nationalism down. That's what they did with the Northern Kingdom, right? When the Assyrians took over, they, they spread the Jews out and put them into different uh, nations. And they, what did they do? Well, they intermarried with other nations. So by the time they came back, they, they were not pure Jews, you know, Samaritans. That's why the people in the southern kingdom did not readily accept them because they were not uh, pure in their, uh, uh, in their bloodline. They were also, the Jews, a nation of traders and businessmen, so they settled in a lot of different nations. Now, during the Babylonian captivity, uh, 597 BC, the Jews, you know, they, were taken, they were taken to Babylon for 70 years, right? We know about that. During that captivity, they had no access to the temple in Jerusalem for worship. So the people began to gather in homes and other places in order to pray and read scripture and praise and enjoy fellowship. Couldn't go to the temple, there were no priests, couldn't offer sacrifice, you know, none of that. But they still had a desire to express and to practice their faith. So they met in each other's home. Well, this, uh, there we go. This was the beginning of the synagogue or the house of prayer that began while they were in captivity. They didn't have that before. Before the Jews went to Babylon, they only worshiped at the temple. They would come from everywhere to worship at the temple. When they were sent off into Babylonian captivity, they then began to meet in homes. You know, that's why they call it houses of prayer. They would go to you know, brother so-and-so for a prayer. When they were returned to Jerusalem, after 70 years of captivity, in order to rebuild the temple and rebuild the city and the wall and all of that, one of the things that they did was in addition to rebuilding the city and the temple, they also established synagogues in all the different cities and towns in Israel. They brought back that, not tradition, but that practice from their captivities. So those Jews, dispersed for various reasons throughout the Roman Empire, carried on this tradition. They would gather and they would build a synagogue for their weekly meetings. Required 10 heads of families. You had to have 10 heads of families in order to establish a synagogue. Now, these various synagogues became the network of locations that Paul used in his early mission work. Uh, in Acts 13, for example, it says, Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to, should be, well, John Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. But going on from Perga, they arrived at Pisidian, Antioch, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them saying, brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. That was a tradition. Some person, some teacher, traveling teacher would come, worship with them, and they would ask him, do you have a word of encouragement for us? And Paul took advantage of this tradition when they, he would be called upon to speak, what would he do? Well, he would preach the gospel. Has anybody here ever been to a synagogue and attended a synagogue service? I have, very interesting. It is so similar to our services. We, we could take over a Jewish synagogue and have to change practically nothing in order to just transform it into a building that would accommodate our service. Because what do they do? Uh, they start at seven o'clock, not on Sunday, of course. They start at seven o'clock in the evening, Friday night, for example. And the first thing that happens, you know what it is? Announcements. 
<laughs> they make announcements, they do the announcements. There'll be this and there'll be a potluck and Sister Josephine is sick and whatever, let's pray for her. And then what do they do? Someone will get up and lead a prayer. And then what do they do? Someone will stand and say, please take your songbooks to number 322 and they will sing a hymn and another hymn and then there'll be a prayer. And then the big moment, the big moment will be the rabbi will then go to a case, you know, a, a, a unit and open it up and inside of it are scrolls, actual scrolls, and he will take it out and he will lay it on the, wouldn't be the communion table, but there's a table there and you know, spread the thing out and then someone would be invited to, or the rabbi himself, would then read a passage from Isaiah or Jeremiah or Genesis, and then he would talk about that. And then at the one that I was at, they roll up the scroll, and the rabbi and the elders with him go down into the audience, and they parade the scroll you know, up and down the audience and people sitting there will reach over and touch it or kiss it or bow before it. You know, why? The, the word of God. And then they'll put it back in the case and there'll be another song and there'll be a prayer and there'll be an announcement at the end and it'll be over. Well, other than the scroll, we have the communion, very similar, and they sing, no organ. <laughs> And they sing. And that process has been going on for centuries and centuries. Even and now, you know, th there are some variations of this. You know, there are some more modern quote synagogues and there are more conservative synagogues. But basically, that's what's going on. And that's what Paul was doing. That was what he took advantage of in order to preach the gospel. So James, you're wondering, okay, how does he get back to where he was? Well, James is writing to Christian Jews who are dispersed throughout the Roman Empire, who used to go to these synagogues, who were converted, many of them, out of those synagogues into Christianity. So what's going on with these people that makes James write them this letter. Well, first of all, these Christian Jews are feeling alienated because of their faith. They're surrounded by pagan, sinful, unsympathetic people. They, have, uh, they are being influenced by the world's thinking and attitude. They've been rejected by their Hebrew countrymen, even attacked for their faith, but they uh, have defended their stand uh, with Christ, but not without cost. Remember now, uh, they're not only alienated from, the, they have nothing to do with the Gentiles to begin with, because they're Jews, but now they're alienated from fellow Jews. I mean, these guys got nowhere to go. At least with the Jews, they had their small minority, you know, it's us against the world, us against the Gentiles, but now they've become Christians, so they're now alienated from from their own people. They're not even at home anymore. So they're feeling, they're feeling the heat. The old way seemed clearer and easy and so many were faltering under this pressure. So you know, they're starting to be shaky a little bit about their faith. So this then is the historical background that influenced the writing of a letter that teaches how one can achieve practical Christian living despite the, despite the difficulties. You know, why do I call it practical Christianity? Because these people 2,000 years ago were, were, were like separated from the general population because the general population were pagans. Now they're separated from their, uh, uh, from their countrymen and many of them separated from their families because they've converted to Christianity. And they're trying to understand, how do I live this Christian life? How do I do that? I don't have any context anymore. Who am I? 
I don't belong with the pagans and now I don't even belong anymore with my Jewish family, with my Jewish countrymen. I don't go to the synagogue anymore. How do I, you know, how do I live this life? Okay, so that's what the, that's what James, if you keep that in mind, the rest of it starts to make a little, a little sense. Okay, so I've chosen this book to study for three reasons. Number one, it shows us how to live practical Christian living using common, easy to understand language and examples. I love, I love simple. I love simple. Simple and straightforward. That's James. Number two, it covers a lot of critical ideas in five short chapters. You know, when we did Genesis, it took us a year to get through Genesis. 50 lessons, 50 chapters, which by the way are now available on one small little flash drive. It's amazing technology today. Had to plug that in there. And then number three, we, we also live in a similar world. You know, we're surrounded by materialistic, immoral society that does not know or care about God or the things of God. That's the thing. <laughs> all this hoopla you know, about Christmas and Easter and all that kind of stuff on TV and the Pope with a million people. But you know, that doesn't change anybody's life. And many times we're rejected by our own family and the religion that we had. You know, my mother, bless her soul, she's passed on now for many, many, many years. But I mean, I had been, a, I had been not only became a practicing New Testament Christian, but also then became a full-time minister. And then I was a minister with a, a, a television program in Quebec in French. The only network program that the Church of Christ ever had in Canada. And I used to get letters and all kinds of stuff and you know, people would say, yeah, that show, blah, blah, blah. But my mother would watch the program. <laughs> And I remember once, and it was in French, it was in her language, I would speak French so that there was no chance for misunderstanding. And I remember one day, you know, I went and saw her, I said, uh, uh, mother, I used to call her mother, the older I got, the more I called her mother. I said, mother, what'd you think, of, did you see the program? Oh yeah, I watched it, yeah. I said, so what do you think? She says, you know, I really like the blue tie that you wore with the suit. <laughs> Here I was explaining the ins and outs of you know, salvation by faith and the mystery of the gospel and all this good stuff. And the only thing was the color of my tie in relationship to my suit. And it never went beyond that. So 37 years of full-time ministry, not a single conversion of anyone in my family to this day. So, right? We, you know, I'm telling my story, but I'm sure I could get people up here and, and who would tell the same type of story. Same type of story. So the beauty of James is it talks to all of us who kind of feel like fish out of water. He tells us, this is, what, this is what your lifestyle is like. Forget all that other stuff. This is what Christianity is about in very practical way. So anyway, that's the, that's the setup. Nine more lessons of this, different topics. We'll cover the book, cover a lot of stuff. I hope you'll be back next week. Thank you for your attention.